welcome to PAC TV Community News. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. And I'm Julie Thompson. On tonight's show, we stop by Cowork Ducks to learn how co working has changed the way people collaborate and the kinds of workspaces they use. The Holmes Dam Removal Project is in full swing in Plymouth, and we attend Media Day at the construction site to find out what the project's goals are and how it will benefit the town. We join ghost hunters and investigators at the Plymouth Paracon and learn that, according to their research, Plymouth is a haunted town. Ghost hunter and author Darcy Lee joins us in the studio to tell us more. But we start to know tonight's show in Duxbury. Standing 14 feet high above a granite monument on Captain's Hill in Duxbury, a statue of Miles Standish looks out over the panoramic views of the coastal South Shore. PCN visited the state reservation to take in the scenery and to learn about the monument's history, which includes a lightning strike. The Miles Standish Monument was built to commemorate Miles Standish, the military captain of the Pilgrims. This area here where the monument is standing was the site of his farm. And in the late, 18, the late 19th century, some people decided to form an association to create a monument to honor him. It was expensive. They actually ran out of money twice. So if we look up at the monument, we can see there's three distinct lines in the colors of the granite, the base, the middle, and the, the top portions. That's because they ran out of money twice and had to restart fundraising. And then by the time they were able to start construction again, they had, we're either in a different quarry or a different part of the quarry, so the stone is visibly different than the rest. But they finished the statue and dedicated it in 1899, and here it stands today, uh, over 100 years later, for visitors to go up the 125 stairs to the top and enjoy the view. In 1922, lightning struck the statue on top of the monument. Immediate damage of the statue was that the head had fallen off and uh, ended up on the ground. The lightning also damaged exhibits inside of the monument. The lightning traveled down the staircase and damaged the glass cases that were containing several exhibits on the, the ground floor. When they looked to repair the statue, and it's given its location, it's not terribly easy, they discovered that the rest of the statue had also been weakened, so more of the statue had to be replaced than what they originally planned on. Everything that's up there right now would have been replacements. The, the legs of the statue have traveled around quite a bit. They were up in Quincy for a while. Uh, so everything that's up there would have been replaced after the, the lightning strike. It is a bit of a workout to get to the top of the, the 125 stairs, but the view is absolutely worth it, especially this time of year as the leaves start to change. So I definitely encourage anybody who's interested to come on by, say hello to our staff here, take the 125 steps to the top and look at this Massachusetts State Park history while you're doing that, and then enjoy the view. The way we work today has changed. Technological advances allow us to collaborate with more people from more places, increasing our convenience and our productivity. Co-Work Ducks in Duxbury is a new model workplace for our new reality. PCN stopped in to find out what that looks like. The, the Co-Work uh, and, and under the umbrella of co-working uh, is an is a up-and-coming trend that seems to be uh, getting a lot of traction and no sign of uh, it, it stopping. And it's really kind of a, more of a millennial thing where millennials don't sit at a desk, they don't feel comfortable at a desk, and their work is done in a more casual environment. And that's all because of technology. You're working on your laptop and you're able to get yourself comfortable and then you engage in work via your laptop. This is Cowork Ducks. Uh, this is a, uh, a shared uh, office environment, which is a membership-based office. Cowork Ducks here has uh, co-working furniture that is uh, specifically designed for co-work. And uh, this is the first co-working facility in Duxbury and probably in a five mile radius. So it's two thirds what we call hot desk. Hot desk is a non-dedicated desk and it doesn't necessarily have to be a desk. Uh, we have very uh, uh, cool kind of, uh, I call them tech lounges and you get in and the screening and everything plugs in, there's a spot for storage, and you can log yourself into that for the entire day 
and that is your desk. It's got a little arm that swings around and it's ergonomically comfortable for a day of work. Uh, so the furniture is really key to these places. It's more function over form as opposed to going the traditional furniture route of restoration hardware or crate and barrel. We're getting uh, interest from consultants and at-home folks that don't quite want to make the leap yet to a full office with leasing and furniture and utilities and setting it all up and all the logistics and costs. And then you get the supplemental. And the supplemental is really designed behind the commuter uh, person who lives uh, locally, where they may come in one day a week, they may come in every morning or every afternoon, but it's an opportunity if the traffic is, is really uh, jamming that day that they can just spend a couple hours, let traffic subside and get some work done. We're gonna have a minimum of 14 lock and key spaces and we'll have uh, probably the capacity for about another 30 seats in common. Uh, for hot desk folks, they'll include two conference rooms, one small and one large conference room or small and medium conference room, uh, shared printer, copy, scan machine, uh, bathrooms and cafe and other shared amenities for different services that you can uh, add on like mailboxes and print services and package services and those kind of things. And we have great, uh, you know, walkability. We're in a great location of town. And then all of the restaurants and services that are directly on site. Thanks, you too. Bye. Wow. And really, this is the way of the future. I mean, so many people are working remotely or working from home or they have their own business yes. and they don't need the full blown office. This is just a perfect solution to that. And what a great way for startup companies to get into the marketplace small money, a small investment up front. Right. Fantastic. Right. And the comfort to the way, the fact that it's not just a regular desk. It's right. all different types of, of, of workspace environments and comfortable, more home-like uh, atmosphere. Yeah. Very, and very interesting. Ergonomic. Ergonomic. Cafe, yeah. Work cafe. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Great idea. The restoration of Plymouth Town Brook is a project that started in 2002, and the removal of the Holmes Dam is the final major step. PCN attended Media Day for the project to check out its progress, learn about its goals, and find out how this entire habitat restoration project will benefit the town of Plymouth. Uh, the project that we're here at right now is the Holmes Dam Removal Project. Um, it'll include the dam removal, but also the replacement of the bridge at Newfield Street. This project will involve reconstruction of a whole new stream channel from Newfield Street all the way up to the Boy Scout Bridge on Billington Street. This will allow for fish passage all the way through and for the removal of the high hazard dam that is currently in this location. A new skate park and bridge across Newfield Street will also be constructed as part of the overall project. Uh, so we did our first dam removal project here in 2002. Um, so we started that um, about 1999. Um, so we're, you know, we're just about at 20 years that we've been working on all of these projects to either improve fish passage, uh, remove unsafe structures, um, and improve water quality not only for Townbrook but into Plymouth Harbor as well. So within the park itself, um, the main focal point will actually be um, an exposed stream. Um, right now it's in a culvert underground so you don't see it. Um, so we call that daylighting when you build a new channel and expose it to, to daylight again. Um, and so you'll actually see that. That'll be the focal point of the park. Uh, we'll also reconstruct a brand new skate park, a brand new basketball court, new paths, new lighting. Um, so the park will be a pretty nice park when all's said and done. And again, that's just one of the phases of the project. So as we do the dam removal restoration and the bridge work, as we work our way out, we'll restore the park as well. And uh, we'll leave a pretty beautiful park when we're all done. With a construction project like this underway in the historic town of Plymouth, there's still always a chance you're going to uncover something that may have been buried long ago. So there's, some, um, there's an historic and archaeological site behind me that's part of our permitting process. Um, and so there was an old mill here. Um, original mill dates back to sometime in the 1790s, um, more activity in the 1800s. And as part of our permitting process, we have an archaeological firm that um, is doing the recording and um, excavation of that area. So they've been out for about a week and a half um, and they'll be having all their findings uh, recorded, submitted to Mass Historic um, so that we'll know as much as we can about the mills and the excavation before we actually start the dam removal. Uh, we, ha we have one other project that we're looking at to improve fish passage and that's at the Jenny Grist Mill. Uh, it wouldn't be a dam removal project but it would be a bypass channel that 
um, we're at least in the feasibility stage of looking at and seeing whether or not that's something that's possible. Um, but if it is, it's something that could um, also increase passage uh, around that mill um, and upstream to the rest of the brook and into Billington Sea. We have some, some pretty tight timelines, um, time of year restrictions for fish passage. We need to have our stream channel work um, done by next spring when the fish actually try to migrate upstream. So we have time of year restrictions for that. And then we have a lot of grant funding involved. So this is the second week of construction. So we're right at the beginning and we'll be doing work throughout the winter um, and wrapping up the project in, um, in June. Plymouth is a haunted town. So say dozens of ghost hunters and paranormal investigators who gathered at the John Carver Inn for the Plymouth Paracon, a three-day conference filled with tours, lectures, and ghosts. PCN was there to witness the supernatural. Are you standing behind Carol? If you are, just reach out and touch her left hand. Okay, thank you. Do you like staying next to me? The Plymouth Paracon is a roving paranormal convention, and the goal really is to showcase Plymouth in all of its glory. It's exciting that we have people who are internationally known for paranormal investigations who will be with us to, uh, over the weekend. John Zaffis and Doogie and Porter from Haunted Towns. What brings me to Plymouth is uh, the opportunity to investigate, uh, be part of this uh, convention, and uh, talking about being involved with the paranormal for the past 44 years. I would say that it's a lot of darkness here, and I think it has to do with 1620, uh, with the original founding of Plymouth and all the death and destruction that happened in the area. So there's a tension here. There's definitely a Native American tension when it comes to the energy here. However, uh, the John Carver and I picking up, we're picking up a kid spirit, uh, so kind of a playful kid spirit, uh, and we're also picking up a, sort of a, of a, a woman as well. So there are there are happy ghosts, and I think they're happy to see all these paranormal people gathering in Plymouth to communicate with them. There are also some other things that run around sometimes up on Burial Hill that are not human, uh, they are of the earth, called cryptids, uh, that tend to come out and tease people a little bit every now and then. I myself have been witness to it, as have my tour groups on occasion. Uh, we've had experiences with the little creatures called puckwudgies. Um, so they don't hurt people, they tease people, they are mischievous at best. Uh, and they just don't know right from wrong. The John Carver Inn is very haunted. The third floor is reportedly the most haunted area in the hotel. The sexton of the Church of the Pilgrimage used to work uh, maintenance here at the John Carver and tell, told me stories about seeing people down the hallway and when he would approach them they wouldn't be there any longer. There is speculation that this site was once the site of a house where medical students lived and those medical students would grave rob up at Burial Hill, bring the cadavers down to the house, perform experiments on them, and then take them back up to bury them, back up in Burial Hill. That's the legend associated with the John Carver Inn. However, I can say as someone that deals with the paranormal that this hotel is extremely haunted. I myself have had a personal experience uh, here in town at the John Carver when I was bringing my son to a swim night for Boy Scouts and we were going up the staircase and down the hallway towards the pool and there was a gentleman in a suit walking in front of us. He took a right hand turn into a dead end hallway and then when we got abreast of that spot he was no longer there. We're not really sure what it is. It, it could be the fact that it's right next to town, uh, town Square. And town Square has a lot of history, including Burial Hill, which is one of the most haunted cemeteries in Massachusetts, based on my experience. Uh, and then there's also uh, what's uh, the, the area where uh, King Philip, his head was put on a pike right in front of Town Square. So we're in, in hallowed ground when it comes to the paranormal. And tonight, after my talk, we'll be doing an investigation of room 309. Did an investigation about three months ago in the room. Uh, we picked up a, sa a male sailor uh, that's residing in that room. Uh, things that are reported, things like move mysteriously, uh, televisions turn on and off, lights turn on and off. Uh, so we're trying to get to the root of that tonight in our investigation.
And then Saturday night, we're going to do an investigation at the Church of the Pilgrimage, uh, which may or may not be haunted, but it's in a location that's close to Burial Hill, and there's a lot of hauntings associated with Town Square, so we're hoping that there are ghosts, ghosts associated with uh, Church of the Pilgrimage. And what I enjoy more than anything is going in for the first time. Now, what's even more exciting to me is I'm bringing a whole group of people. I'll be with people investigating. They're going to experience it at the same time I'm experiencing it. So it's the first time for me, first time for them. And if things can get validated and things occur and things happen, to me, that's a wahoo moment. Why? I don't care about what John Zayoff's experience is. I care more about what other people experience because that helps to validate it. I've seen people get scratched, pushed, shoved seen people levitate, uh, heard people talk in you know, different languages and different voices, know information that they shouldn't know about. There's a lot of things that I've experienced over the course of the years that I can't rule out as just coincidence. Am I expecting paranormal activity up here in Plymouth, Massachusetts? I don't rule anything out. We are so pleased to have on set today Darcy Lee, who is the author of Ghosts of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Welcome, Darcy. Thank you, Julie. You're not only an author, there's a other history behind you, so what is it? Yes, I am a nonprofit executive specializing in fundraising. Yep, for, especially for girls. Um, yes, right now I'm the Director of Development for the Women's Fund of Southeastern Massachusetts. But in the past, some people may know me as the person who ran the capital campaign at Pilgrim Hall Museum and also consulted for First Parish Plymouth, Plymouth 400, among other organizations. So you're into history. Yes. Clearly, so this is one of the reasons why you wrote this book. That is correct. So people think of Plymouth as America's hometown and a celebration and wonderful and happy. And, and on the back of your book, it's funny because part, part of what you say is um, Plymouth actually, the real story of the town, is a tale of grim beginnings, plague, desperation, massacre, murder, and fear. So how do you circle that square? Sure. Well, Plymouth itself, prior to when the Pilgrims landed in 1620, was the home of the Patuxent Indians. Mm -hmm. And two years prior to the Pilgrim landing, that tribe was decimated. They were felled by the plague. And so when the Pilgrims arrived, they arrived to bleach white bones on the land that they would then settle. And let's remember, too, that the Pilgrims did not have an easy journey here to right. the New World. They were set off course by a terrible storm. Disease also infiltrated their community, mm -hmm. and they lost half of their community within the first winter. Yeah. Okay. So they arrived to this place where it was really the only thing there, and the landscape was these bleached bones of this Native American tribe who had all died. That's correct. So, so that kind of begins a not a great... <laughs> soulful place right. to start your lives. It, it was a hard place yeah. to start the new lives of the, of the pilgrims who right. were searching for religious freedom. And so we can just imagine the fear and desperation yeah. that they felt. That could be embedded in the land. I believe it is, and okay. I believe that's why Plymouth is so haunted. Okay, so you, you talk about a number of different places in Plymouth that you believe have hauntings or is haunted mm -hmm. for one reason or another. So let's start with Burial Hill, which is a beautiful historic location here in downtown Plymouth. It is indeed a beautiful and historic location and it offers um, people, visitors, as well as people who live in the community, one of the best views yes, um, of, the harbor. of the harbor. It's stunning. So yep. It is stunning, but it's also very haunted. And it may not be haunted by the people who are buried there, necessarily their, their bones because they're buried there, but instead it's haunted by the people who would have been visiting there in real life. There's a Victorian couple that walks up and down Burial Hill from Summer Street to a small white grave marked Ida Lizzie, three years. I did the historical research behind it, the mm -hmm. genealogical research, and I found out who the, that couple was. Yeah. It was Elizabeth and Thomas Spear, and mm -hmm. they were visiting the grave of their daughter, 
Ida Elizabeth. Who died at three years old. Who died at three years and old. And people have actually seen these apparitions? People have seen the full body apparitions of this couple dressed in a Victorian attire. Now, they would be walking up and down the hill, carrying with them a great sense of grief, mm -hmm. loss, and sorrow. And so that type of haunting is considered a residual haunting, where it's like a movie that plays over and over right. of what the people would have been doing in their real lives. And that's why that imprint is there and that imprint is so strong. Wow, okay. Um, the houses of downtown Plymouth, there's a number of houses that you refer to in the book that have different hauntings associated with them. Why don't you tell us about a few of those? Sure, one that comes to mind is the Winslow Warren House. Yeah. That's located on the corner of North Street and Main Street. It is not open to the public. It is currently serving as office space as well as a storefront. Um, but I got from firsthand from a person who ran a business there mm -hmm. that it is haunted by the person who originally built it, General James Winslow. Okay. And he was he made himself um, appear mm -hmm. in full body apparition at the time when the office space that she was using as a store was being renovated. Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense for hauntings because when you start to stir up what the the bones of the house, the original foundation, the original yep. foundation, mm -hmm. the original structure of the mm -hmm. house those that remain behind might be a little bit uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. It changes their perspective mm -hmm. of, the, of the house. They might not even know that they're haunting the house, but they know where they're at. And so for him to appear at that time while they were doing construction, um, I think is pretty yeah. significant. And there was another uh, mention of shoes that were, were yes. in the walls. So what, yes. is, what does that mean? And what's shoes. the significance of that? Sure. This was in a private residence. Okay. Um, and those shoes that were found in the walls could be a little bit creepy to people, right? Yeah. Sounds a little creepy when <laughs> you open the up the yep. wall to do renovations yeah. and you find children's shoes in the walls. It's not creepy at all, actually. Okay. Um, in fact, for hundreds of years from Western Europe, um, it was a tradition in Western Europe and made its way here mm -hmm. to the colonies, people would put shoes in walls because they believed that the aroma of a human foot would attract a demon, and the demon would make its way into the shoe and get caught at the toe and not be able to, to back get back out. out. Like a lobster trap. <laughs> like a lobster <laughs> trap. Okay. So those shoes brought good fortune to the home, and they were also a, a, um, a sign of fertility for the home. Wow. Um, so that's where we get this tradition of shoes and walls. Okay. Now that particular home, once the shoes were removed from the walls, mm -hmm. did experience a haunting that was um, more than mischievous okay. and more like a poltergeist type haunting. Okay, which is not the good kind of haunting. Not the good kind. Okay. Um, the John Carver Inn, and there's another um, sh section on, on the show today about a, a paranormal uh, mm -hmm. group that came through the John Carver Inn, and that is said to be quite haunted. It's quite haunted. And we did an investigation during Plymouth Paracon, which was in September. We did an investigation of room 309, which is considered the most haunted room in the hotel. Okay. There's lots that came out of that investigation. So it was pretty exciting, but there's still more pieces to put together. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it was indeed true that there was a house where medical students lived on that, on that property, site, on right? that yeah. site, but it's likely yeah. because on that site was once the, the site of hundreds of homes that were demolished during urban renewal yep. in the 1960s, mm -hmm. and a street on that site was Thatcher Street, mm -hmm. named for Dr. James Thatcher. Right. He actually owned the property on that street. So it could be likely mm -hmm. that there were medical students living in a home. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon that grave robbing happened. So that they could practice on the that cadavers. That they could practice yep. on the cadavers yeah. and learn about anatomy and then return them to Burial, to Burial Hill. Hill. Okay, so there you go. There's the connection mm -hmm. there. Um, how do you measure, by the way, um, what 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 is the measurement of if there's something in the room that shouldn't be there? 
Well, there are a number of different ways that paranormal investigators measure. They measure with a K2 meter, so Which it's is? an electromagnetic field detector. It detects okay. energy in the room. Okay. There's also a new app out um, that's being employed. We actually used it for the first time during the investigation of the Church of the Pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. It's called Echovox. Okay. And that picks up phonetic sounds that then can be put together as words okay. by any sort of oh, spirit or entity that wants to communicate present, with you. Can oh, communicate with us. They can the communicate room. via app. Yes. That's pretty cool. Um, Cordage Park. Cordage Park, a lot of people think that it's very, very haunted. Mm -hmm. I would say it's very haunted rather than very, very haunted. Okay. It's of where course, they used to make ropes. It's right. Yep. That's right. It's the former rope factory. Yep. Um, and so lots and lots of people pass through those doors yep. every day for hundreds of, oh, more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. There were also other buildings on the Cordage site that served for different purposes. Okay. Um, tragically, someone was murdered in a building on the site okay. that was connected to an office building mm -hmm. um, that had also been part of the Cordage company. And that office building is reportedly haunted, okay, where and electronics go a little haywire. Wire. Okay. And lastly, in our last few seconds, uh, the lighthouse. Sure, the Gurnet Lighthouse. Yep is reportedly haunted by the first keeper's wife, mm -hmm. Hannah, who watches over. Lighthouses evoke a certain romanticism. Anyway, folklore, right? all of them. Yeah. All of yeah. them. But it's also haunted, um, the Gurnet itself is haunted by the seamen who perished uh, on the brigantine General Arnold, where they froze to death in the blizzard of 1778. And the entire... Um, the entire the crew, and the, the entire crew of that, uh, that ship right. was was wiped out. Most of the yeah. crew. Yeah, and it's really it's a really sad story, and it's you, you go into that story. in your book also. Yes. Yeah, I do. Well, I mean, there's people who who love this or are interested in this. The Ghosts of Plymouth, Massachusetts, is a fascinating read. Um, for it's it's very educational, and there's a lot of history in here too, which is wonderful. Thank you, Darcy. It was so good to have you. Thank you. And thank you. If you'd like to see the show again, you can find PAC TV Community News on YouTube and also on our website. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook to get up-to-date info. From all of us at PAC TV, thank you for watching and have a great week.